Hey teachers, this is the third and final video of our introduction to Ephesians. I'd anticipated there being a fourth video, but I'm making the last two, smashing them into one because uh, last week the COVID threw me off track. I'm doing much better. I'll be waiting on, uh, waiting on getting a test in the next couple of days to um, make sure I can come back and be with you guys this Sunday the 29th. That's my goal, uh, but you'll be hearing more about that later anyway. But if you see your attachment, I've attached a document called What is Ephesians All About? And so in this video and in this document, I try just to summarize what the book of Ephesians is saying. And in the, the first section of this, I want to break down the meaning of Ephesians through three different lenses, Christology, discipleship, and mission. So what does it tell us about Christ? What did Jesus do? That's very fundamental to what Paul says in Ephesians. And then how this affects our walk, as he uses so frequently in this epistle. And then what our walk is about. To what end are we walking and following Jesus? What, what's the mission we have in Christ and Ephesians? Um, I heard it said that Colossians, if Colossians was talking about the Christ of the church, Ephesians is talking about the church of the Christ. And I think that's a very good summary. <clears throat> Ephesians is all about the church as God always planned for it to be, what he's doing in Jesus and what God did with us when we became part of the church. So first of all, let's talk about Christology. What Jesus is doing is uniting all things. In Ephesians, Paul sees the work of Jesus on the cross as the, the plan, the, the, the moment by which God reconciles everything together. And this is in chapter 1, verse 10 where Paul uh, begins, begins saying this, to unite all things in him, both in heaven and on earth. So later on in chapter 2, then Paul gets specific about what this means. He brought Jews and Gentiles together by the cross. He is our peace. He, Jesus broke down that wall of division, that hostility by his own flesh on the cross. And so Ephesians 2 verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He is our peace. So unity then comes from Christ's work on the cross. It's not just some fundamental aspect of humanity. We can only be united, Paul says, by Jesus. It is through Christ, through the gospel, that we can be united. And so, and that's why in Ephesians 4, Paul says that we have to endeavor to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We don't create unity in the church. The, the church is already united. We just have to maintain the unity that Jesus has already established in the church. And there are some quotes from a couple different uh, commentaries and books in here that I thought were uh, worthwhile. You can read those. Second, talk about discipleship. Eight times in Ephesians, Paul says for us to walk, or he describes our walk. And the turning point is in chapter 4 where he says, uh, therefore, I therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So Paul is using the idea of walking to illustrate a transformed way of life. And this transformed way of life involves unity in the church. And it, the walking delineates many things in Ephesians. First of all, in chapter 2, the first occurrence of the word, he talks about our former way of walking, which was according to our, the lust of the flesh and the prince of the power of the air. But then we've been transformed to walk a different way. And he has made us for good works if we walk in them. In chapter 2, verse 10. So that's actually an inclusio, which is like a bracketing off of that first 10 verses of Ephesians 2. So the whole idea there is you were walking this way. Now, because of the grace of God, you're walking this way. And what does this look like? It means that we are. he took both different and made them one, Christ is our peace. That's Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. So walking is a big part of this. And uh, let me just read this paragraph here. This is from a, an article, an academic article by Mark Sterling I came across. The repetition of walk in Ephesians is a structural feature that communicates Paul's concern that those who are described in 1-1 as saints and faithful and who are created in 2-15 into the one new humanity should grasp the important importance of ethical transformation that is reflective of their new reality. However, it is not only that this ethical transformation reflects the new humanity, it also fosters and maintains unity. 
This last point is of particular importance for the functioning of God's people as the dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So we walk in such a way that shows a transformed life, and we walk in a way that shows we are united as the body of Christ. And those two things are important because we are the church, the dwelling place for God by Spirit. Okay, so third, mission in Ephesians. And I'm taking this from that same article from Mark Sterling. And he sees the temple imagery in Ephesians 2 as indicative or as reflective allusions to Isaiah and Zechariah, when I think he's right. Um, back in Isaiah and Zechariah, the, the prophets saw the Messiah. One thing he would do is building the temple or rebuilding the temple. And in the latter part of Isaiah, the temple's been destroyed. And Zechariah, they're longing for the time when the temple is rebuilt in its splendor and glory. And in Ephesians 2, Paul says that that's happening right now. Jesus is, has rebuilt the temple, but it's us. The temple comprises the people, not a physical location. And that's very important for what we're doing because the temple functioned as the dwelling place of God on earth. And that meant that from the temple, the, the peace goes out. From the temple, the priests uh, worked to mediate and to intercede for the world. The entire nation of Israel was a nation of priests. And so their job initially and always fundamentally was to be priests for the whole world, not just this little group of Jews who kept to themselves. They're supposed to always go out. There was mission even in the Old Testament. And so for us, that means that we are part of this mission. Jews and Gentiles have not only been brought near by the blood of Christ, but we're smack dab on top of each other, if I can use an Alabama phrase. And so we're no longer strangers and aliens. We're fellow citizens. We're members of the house of God. And we're built on top of one another. And in 2.22, that phrase, in whom you also are being built together, indicates a process of growth. So it's not just that Jesus built us into this temple and then that's it. We have nothing to do. We're in the process of being molded in our, as stones to fit close together as his body. And so it's a process we're going through. Uh, and the church comprised in the temple means that we carry a mission as a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We are to be the ones who go out into the world and bring others into this holy relationship with God. So all of that is the grand theology. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 in Ephesians are the, the, the theological basis for what Paul's saying. And then in 4, 5, and 6, Paul's saying what this looks like. What does it look like for us to be the temple of God? What does it look like for us to be joined together? As Jews and Gentiles, as man and woman in every relationship? Well, in chapter 4, he's talking about in the church, it looks like the diversity of gifts come together to build up the body of Christ. We speak the truth in love where every part contributes its part to the whole of the church. Chapter 5, it's man and woman coming together. In chapter 6, it's parent and child. It's even slave and master. All these relationships that existed for a long, long time, are now being transformed and even subverted by the gospel. And so our mission starts in our home, and it goes out into the world all around us. Now, what I want to do in this last couple minutes here is give you Ephesians in a nutshell. This is important because for me, the many times I've read Ephesians and thought about it, it's always been piecemeal. You know, I've thought about Ephesians at, you know, chapter one, there is this great poem you know, we have all the, the God talk, you know, the, uh, the redemption, forgiveness, adoption, chosen, predestination, all those big words are there in Ephesians 1. And in Ephesians 2, we have salvation. We have uh, the, the grace of God. We're saved by grace through faith. Chapter 3, I would see the great prayer of Paul that uh, God can do more things in you than you can even think or imagine. Chapter 4, you know, we see the gifts, uh, the, the great ones, and we see the different gifts in the body. Chapter 5 talks about marriage. Chapter 6 talks about parenting and uh, the, the armor of God of spiritual warfare. But that's really kind of that slicing and dicing all of it. It's not, it's not talking about all those things in separate little, th separate little columns. All of those things come together for one thing Paul is saying. The one thing is Jesus is doing something new. He's bringing everything together. God has brought and is bringing everything together in Jesus. And all those little things support that one argument that Paul is making in Ephesians. Everything's coming together in Christ. That's his point. 
So let me try to, in a nutshell, give you one verse from each chapter that kind of some, uh, builds on this argument. Chapter 1, verse 10, that's for plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things in earth. So that prayer that begins Ephesians, that God willing, I'll be preaching this, this Sunday morning, uh, it's talking about his plan that he's revealed to us, which is to unite all things in Christ. So the present reign of Christ, which he talks about at the end of chapter 1, assures this inevitability. That's chapter 1, big cosmic plan in chapter 1. He's uniting everything in heaven and earth together. Chapter 2 is a little more personal for us. Because chapter 2, verse 10, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Which, so that means what's our place in this great cosmic plan that God has orchestrated? It's that we should be his workmanship. His, our place in this grand plan is to be who God made us to be. He's uniting us together, and we should walk in his good works. The purpose of our lives is to walk in his good works. And we demonstrate his peace uh, that he talks about the latter part of chapter 2. So, chapter 3, verse 10, So that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So, when we do this, he's got this cosmic plan of unity. And he doesn't really say it in chapter 1. He doesn't come out and say he's uniting all things, what this looks like. In chapter 2, he says what this looks like. Jews and Gentiles coming together in unity by the peace that Jesus has made on the cross. Chapter 3 then shows it's the church that shows this mystery. We are the ones that display the manifold wisdom of God. When people look from the world into the church, what they should see are people getting along, people loving each other. And that should be, how in the world is this possible? It's the great multifaceted, multi-splendored wisdom of God. So in chapter 4, verse 15, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So far from driving us apart, the diversity we have in the church should be what builds us up together. It should be what strengthens the whole entire body. And a lot of what he says in chapter 4 is to that end. Chapter 5, uh, verse 2, To walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So in chapter 1, Paul saw heaven and earth coming together. In chapter 2, Paul saw Jew and Gentile coming together. Now in chapters 5 and 6, Paul sees all the human relationships coming together. Man and woman coming together. We're walking in love. Every part of our lives, every relationship is coming together. And it's because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So to sum that all up, chapter 16, chapter 6, verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. So this great reconciliation is not easy. It's not easily maintained. Jesus died for it. And for us to maintain this unity, it's going to be difficult. The devil wants to pull us apart. He wants to divide, divide, divide. We have to work to unite. And so to do that, Paul says, take up the whole armor of God. Arm yourself because we are fighting not against people, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And that is Ephesians in a nutshell.